Okay. So I see uh, we lost a bit, little bit of audience in between, uh, but still that's good. So my name is uh, Roy Schulteis and I work as a solutions engineer for Delphix. And first of all, I want to thank uh, AB and AMRO for hosting the event. Um, I think that's great, and, and it's really a great location. And I also want to thank Jim Leach, who uh, works for ULA. And um, Delphix works closely with ULA on the Dutch market, so if after the presentation you have some questions about the Delphix technology in particular, then um, Jim is also a contact person for you, sitting here in front. Um, so today I'm going to talk about databases in continuous delivery, and I think you all know that there are lots of tools for continuous delivery, but what I think the missing link is in all these tools, and every time I wake up there are new tools on the internet, um, the missing link is the databases, and that typically is what's giving you the backlogs. Um, so if you think about Delphi, so I think you, you're all familiar with VMware and what it did to the servers or to the operating system. So the ability to um, spin up servers instantly without putting the hardware on the ground. Now Delphix is similar, so Delphix is the VM there for application data. So think of Delphix as being the VM there for application data. Um, during this talk, um, I want to, uh, I'm going to explain briefly what Delphix is. Maybe first of all a question, has anyone, maybe Hannah, heard about Delphix before this evening? That's one, two, three, four, five, that's great. That's, <laughs> the last time I spoke about Delphix in Germany, there was no hand. Mm. And that's interesting because we have a great customer base actually. Um, so it's interesting that nobody, typically nobody has heard about it. So if you think about your IT estate to date, then you have to manage 10, 20, hundreds of applications. And for all of these applications, you have this constant demand for new upgrades, new functionalities. You have to, uh, to deliver new functionalities to the market. And for, for all of these applications, you actually have this, um, yeah, this demand to deliver new functionalities to the market. But all of these projects actually kick off um, big database, uh, big data management requirements. So all of these projects actually require a test environment, a dev environment, a UAT environment. And typically when we when I talk to our customers, then the biggest cause for delays in projects, which is giving you the backlogs, is actually around um, data management and the complexity around data management. And the reason for that actually is that um, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, wait one second. Yeah, sorry. Just checking one thing. Um, so the reason for that is that environments are getting bigger and bigger, and but at the time it, so the data you have to move around becomes bigger and it takes longer and longer. So, um, and, and also you, the fact that you cannot look at an application in isolation, so you may want to have your customer system, your sales system, your trading system, so the ability to synchronize them all to a, to a particular point in time. It's just um, adds an additional operational, uh, an additional operational cost. Um, so what I, what we see actually, what, what customers are doing is um, instead of full in, of providing full environments, is that compromises are being made, and these compromises are subsets are being generated. Um, people are working with uh, with synthetic data. Multiple testers and developers are working on the same environment, so you have these clashes between environments. Uh, what we also see is that test and development environments are not being refreshed, so testers and developers are working on stale data. Now, and if you remember, so what, I, I completely agree with what, what Pavel um, said earlier about speed and quality. And quality actually defines the speed of projects. And that is exactly what we find. So there's a real link between the delivery time of projects and the quality that actually developers are working on and testers are working on. 
So if the, if the first real environment or the first representative environment for your production system is your performance test environment and you find your bugs there, then you're right at the end of your project life cycle. So you have to go all the way back to the beginning. So finding bugs early in the development life cycle is actually far more economical. And if you think of that from a commercial perspective, then finding a bug at the beginning of the project life cycle, so during the development phase, may cost you a pound. Finding a bug in the performance or UAT environment costs you maybe 100 pounds, and it's even more expensive if you find it in production. <laughs> so, what Delphix is about is removing all this friction around data management, complexity of moving data around, and improving the quality <coughs> of environments that testers and developers are working on. <coughs> and mainly focusing here on the project delivery, but there are the use cases as well, and I will touch on them later in the presentation. work anymore. So let's have a look at um, how data management or the legacy way of providing environments. So typically you have a developer who has a demand for a fresh environment that he wants to work on, that he wants to deliver a new feature on. Then typically he goes to a manager and a manager approves maybe that, that, that request and then a whole lot of teams have to, have to get together. So system admins, storage admins, backup administrators, database administrators, and maybe two or three weeks later or days later, that environment is ready to go for the developer. And also this project, this process kind of works. I think it doesn't scale with today's business requirements. Now the way Delphix um, works is that Delphix orchestrates and automates this whole process. So now you get an environment at a click of a button. And there are also a lot of things that you can actually, um, that that you cannot, or a lot of functionalities that you, that you just don't have in the physical world. Um, I will touch base on them quickly, um, and I will um, go into more detail later in the presentation. So now, using the data virtualization capabilities, um, it becomes really easy to synchronize different applications or different data sources to a specific point in time. Um, and if you think of, for example, code development, so everyone, I believe, is familiar with version control of code. But till today, it just hasn't been possible to version control data. I think if you would just, if you would start and store all the different versions of data, and you start to store 20, or, or depending on what the size of the database is, all these terabytes over and over again for all these different versions, you would just bankrupt your company in the amount of, of space you would need to store. So with Delphix, you can just, add, or with data virtualization, you can just store hundreds of different versions of data alongside with your application. So you have all these different versions of your application, and now with data virtualization, you can just put the different version under the, underneath. So you have, and you can just spin them up on demand. Now, now let me know how Delphi, so I want to cover a bit about how Delphi works. So very, in a very simple way, typically you have a production system, so the black system here, and you have a multi-tiered stack, so you have an application, a database layer, a storage layer, and then this whole system gets replicated into the non-production system, be it dev, test, QA, and so on. And there's a lot of complexity, as we discussed around that, providing these environments. And all these environments have their own storage, their own database sitting on top of it. So the way that changes with Delphix is that um, we virtualize the storage layer. So Delphix itself is a software appliance that you put on a, on a standard hypervisor like VMware. So you use your own server and you add your own storage to it. And then what we do initially is we make a copy of all the production data and we store that on the Delphix engine. So we typically, so we compress that data and what we see is typically about a half or a third of the original, si of the original size of the data. Now, once we have collected that initial copy, and that is a one-time task, and we never do that again, is we triple feed the changes in from the production system. So we collect the change data from the production system, and we add that to our initial copy. However, we do not actually change existing data blocks, but we do add the change data to our existing, to our existing copy. And what you get is this sort of time machine. 
So from the point in time where you started to, get to collect data from the production until the latest point in time where you did that, you now know how the data looked like for every single point in time down to the second. So now you see how you, how it actually, how you can actually very easily synchronize different data sources to a particular point in time having this time machine capability. Now, in the next step, we can use this time machine and provide virtual copies of the data to the respective target systems. <coughs> and we actually use a shared block structure. And if you think of these target systems, so you may have your customer database, which is a five terabyte database. You're going to copy that around on the blue, on the, on the, on the orange, on the green environment. Then typically 90% of the data just stays the same. You may change 5-10% of the data, but the majority of the data is just the same. So <coughs> there's a huge inefficiency of just copying that same data over and over again. So with Delphix, yeah, we actually deduplicate the data. So for those blocks that are the same, we just share them across the various environment. And it's when you make an insert or an update is when we actually store the respective data blocks on the, on the local disk. But the visibility is still for the respective environment. So everyone, in the same way as before, has its own read writable copy of a database that it can work with. <coughs> and this whole process is completely automated. So extracting the change data from the production, um, putting it on the Delphix engine, providing the virtual copies to the, to the respective environments, so that now the developers can use the database as a development tool so they can refresh the data from production, they can bookmark the data, they can version the data. So all this becomes really easy to do for the developers. Does this make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Yes. But the database uh, for C, it's for, the, for them it's only a file? Yes, yeah, so for them uh, Delphix just looks like a network attached storage device. Mm -hmm and we present the data over the internet to the respective target environments. And because when we, when we present a virtual copy of the data, and virtual is because we are not physically duplicating the data blocks, when we present that virtual copy, we can also we can do that instantly because we are just sharing the same blocks with the other environments. So now a 20 terabyte database is, how long does it actually take to start up the database? But we can present those data files instantly to the respective environment. Uh, do you get a performance penalty on the production server if you copy or keep incremental changes from the production side to the to the local uh, development side? Yeah. So typically we do we do not see that. Um, uh, the way how we extract the changes from the production server depends on what the database is or what the data is. So typically data is stored <laughs> in databases. So if you think of an Oracle database, we start taking an RMN level zero backup. And we will then take incremental backups, or so level one backups, to get the data onto the Delphix engine. And we can also use, read the archive redo logs from the file system to get the changes in. You can also schedule that. So if you see a performance hit on the production system, then you can schedule the, these check, these, the, the extraction of the changes to whenever uh, you feel that the log, you, can, you can deal with the log. With SQL Server, um, it's similar. But with SQL Server, we, we direct, so if you make a backup from your SQL Server and you put that on a file system, we can directly read the changes from that backup onto the Delphix engine, and we can also read the differential backups onto the, onto the, um, onto the Delphix file system. And then for that time machine capability, you actually specify a policy for how long you want to keep that data. So you have this rolling copy moving forward where we add changes, the new changes on the one side, and all changes that are older than what you define in your policy, so for example, seven days, 30 days, then we, we just remove them. So you have this rolling copy moving forward, where for each different point in time down to the second, we can have a look at how did the data look like at that point in time. And how do you compress the data? Yeah, please. How do you compress the data? Uh, we have just co uh, typical compression methods, or, or just, I mean, I don't know exactly what the compression algorithm is. We compress the data, and we compress the data actually for performance reasons. It sounds a bit strange, but typically when you, when you think of that picture that I showed previously, where every server has its own disk, so now you actually have one disk with Delphix. So you can see that typically the disk becomes a bottleneck. So what we want to achieve is reduce the amount of reads and writes on that particular disk. 
And that's why we actually compress the data. So when the data is stored compressed on the file system, then when you read the data, you only have to read less from the less data blocks because now they are compressed. The penalty you have to pay is you actually have to decompress the data. Now decompressing the data typically would happen on the target servers, but because we are using this Ethernet-based infrastructure, we can actually decompress the data on the DevX engine and therefore do it transparently towards the target servers. Now the other thing about this is, um, typically when you have one copy and you make three virtual copies of it, then chances are that you get the same request for data blocks from the respective target servers. <coughs> So what we can use is also the memory that you assign to the Delphix engine. So for those blocks that have already been requested, we store them in a compressed fashion into the memory. So when we get a similar request, requesting the same data blocks, we can actually deal with it from the memory and further reduce the load on the underlying disk. So we actually, if you think about it, we add CPU and memory power onto the storage channel. You mentioned a uh, copy production data to non production Yes. There are problems like uh, from uh, there is legislation even about uh, uh, anonymizing the data. Yeah, that is a great question. Right anything about it? Uh, yeah. So the, the answer is yes. I thought about it, and I will come back to it on, on the next slide if that's fine. I think it's the next slide. Any more questions until here? Sorry. Um, before I come to the masking, I just want to um, come back to what I said earlier about finding defects in the, in the software development lifecycle. So I think having these virtual copies and have, having this ability to actually bookmark data, refresh data, and reset data, um, I think it's all about what Pavel said earlier about the feedback loops. So when you, when you think about what you initially do, you provide a database, you run a test, in test, dev and test, you may work on subsets of data, synthetic data, different testers and developers working on the same environment. Um, this is actually a study that one of our customers did. And this is what we had previously. So many defects were found actually in UAT. And a few of these defects were only, were only found in dev. So with Delphix, because you now have this, this short feedback loops, now we can see how this starts to work and how these feed short feedback loops help to actually have, get a real shift left. So finding defects early in the development life cycle. And this is just a huge impact on the overall software development life cycle. So how fast are you actually able to release new functionalities into production? And one more slide about the testing. So I think um, from what I discussed earlier about being able to instantly provide a database no matter what the size is. Um, so here I have, a, I have another example where one company did one test after the year, so very serialized testing. And the majority of the time was actually restoring, restoring the database to a particular point in time. So getting it ready for the test, run the test, which was actually just a, a, a small test, and then restoring the whole database again. So you can now see, being able to very quickly provision databases onto target systems, all these restore times just go away, and you can run one test after the other and very quickly get to a, get to a better software quality. <coughs> um, now come back to actually what you said, and I think database security in this whole world is very important. And it's particularly important when you're dealing with databases. So when you're dealing with personal identifiable information, and I think there's a good, there are good reasons to not use real data in non-production systems. Now the first reason is from what you've seen in the first slides, and I think we are all aware of that, is, I mean, given that one production system is typically supported by many non-production systems, DEF, TEST, UAT, and so on, the majority of the data is actually stored in non-production systems. And non-production systems are typically far less secure than production systems. So you have more developers with high-privileged accounts, um, you have DBAs, you have lots of DBAs, and they are less monitored than production systems. So I think there are good reasons to secure data in non-production systems. And the other reason is, um, there's this general data protection law, which has huge fines for companies. It's coming in place in 2018. Maybe hands up who has heard about the GDPR? Okay, so that's, I think, maybe 20% of the people in here. 
So it's a general data protection law that's coming in place in 2018 and it's replacing all the national laws, data protection laws, basically. And um, when you lose data, now with the new GDPR, you actually have to inform the European authorities within, I believe it was 20, uh, 27 hours. You have, to be, you have to inform your customers about your data being, being stolen also. And there are huge fines for companies which can be up to, at least the latest number was 4% of the annual revenue of a company, so huge. Uh, all right, I say that also directors, can we have personally responsible? Absolutely, uh, that's, yeah. So also directors can be help, can be made personally responsible for losing data. So I think re replacing real data, non-production data with fictional, realistic data becomes key and becomes standard, I believe, in the new world. And before I actually worked for Belfix, I worked for the information security team for Oracle. When I spoke to customers, there were many challenges that have been highlighted why actually customers do not mask data or do not secure the data. And I want to touch base on that quickly. I will then later also explain why masking and virtualization um, complement each, uh, each other very well. So the first thing I got mentioned was speed. So it takes a long time to actually provide a new environment. And just masking data, if you, if you talk about huge databases, adds another two, three days on this environment, downtime on this environment, which means the time it takes to actually provision an environment, making an environment ready, is also the developer cannot work on that environment. And masking just adds another few days of that. Now the second one is it's very difficult to, to, to mask data. You have to, you have to find the right algorithm, you have to present the realistic data to the application, credit card numbers, email addresses, and so on. And the third one, and I think it's the most important one, you cannot look at an application in isolation anymore. You have to look at an application in an integrated environment. So you may, as I said earlier, if your customer application, sales, trading application, so if you mask data in one application, then you have a service bus between there, queuing systems, you may have a SOA layer on top of it, so these applications talk to each other. So when you take a customer uh, record from one database and you want to match that with the customer record in the other record in the other database, you want to make sure that if you mask the data, you do that consistently across the database, otherwise it's not going to work anymore. And once you solve the first three of that, then you want to make sure that this process is actually repeatable. So you can do this masking process over and over again. So once you have changes in production, you get them into your non-production system and improve the quality of that environment so you get a realistic testing. Are there any other challenges that you see around data masking? Or do you think this covers more or less what you're doing? Typically, when I, when, I, when I initially showed this slide, I asked who is actually masking data, but um, I understand that's a sensible question and I, and I won't ask it here. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Before I go more into data masking, so. Um, what I've prepared, as I said earlier, is also a little demo environment. And this is actually the logical architecture of my demo environment. So I'll explain a bit what my demo environment consists about. And I will then show what you see here on my demo environment. Um, but demo being a demo, so it might be over after 10 minutes. But, um, so what I have is I'm simulating a production system. And I'm taking a look at the, the, the two major databases, I believe, from the Oracle database. Uh, which are called LLGR2, a SQL Server database, and for simplicity, I also um, have an application configuration directory. So this is the data of my production system, let's assume that. And on that Oracle database, I have an HR database running on it, because HR typically is sensitive data. Now, what I have next is I have this um, Delphic system here. So I'm changing, I'm changing, uh, collecting the changed data onto the Delphix um, engine. Now, now is what where um, data masking actually comes in place. So I have this physical copy that I took from production sitting on the Delphix engine. Now what I do next is I make a virtual copy available on, the, for example, staging system as an optional step, but it's what I need to do when I want to mask the data. So I make a virtual copy available on, on, a, on a target server, and I then run my masking methods against this virtual copy of the database. So what Delphix is actually going to store is the data that I'm actually changing, so to mask the data. So the storage overhead you see is how many data, how many records did you actually change to secure your data? 
So now, for the Delphi Center, you have a secure data, uh, an original copy and a mask copy, both available, because you can say, for reporting purposes, I may want to have a copy that's unmasked. For development test, I may want a copy that is masked. Now, on Delphi, I have this original copy, the masked copy, a masked virtual copy, and now I can also take this masked virtual copy as a source for my testing environments. So you can not only create a virtual copy based on a real copy, but I can also use a virtual copy as a source to create further child copies. So not only parent-child, but also child-child. And that is important because now I don't only have to mask once, and I can use a mask copy and create as many virtual copies as I need for my test and development environments. So now the testers get these copies of all of these virtual copies secured from production in their own production environments. Plus they get this functionality that they get also this time, this time flow capability where they have maybe version one, um, then refresh the data and they get the latest data from production or you have uh, T3 or it's version one and at some point it chooses to do a reset so it goes back in time and resets this whole database to just back to the beginning. <coughs> so on the staging server you're just, yep. Could this team three also make changes to their copy of the data and then get back to version one of the data? You mean, is each individual copy able to have change on it as well? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at your environment today, you may have simply, simply say uh, three servers mm -hmm. on which your databases are running. So the only thing that changes is that now the underlying data is provided, is, is provided by Delphix. So the, each of these teams get read-writable copies of their database in the same way that they, get, that they get before. The only thing is having a virtual copies gives you a lot of functionalities that you don't get in the physical world, like refreshing your data almost instantly, so you reduce the turnaround times. Resetting the data to a specific point in time, which is important for continuous delivery where you need this short feedback loops. So to answer your questions, yes, you get um, read-writable copies in the same way as before. And on the staging environment, you're just creating one version after the other <coughs> as, you, as you receive changes from production. So for the development teams, they, have, they can re refresh their data from the Monday version, Tuesday version, Wednesday version, so they can iterate through all the cycles and therefore very effectively test new software releases. <coughs> What you have seen in the logical <coughs> architecture is typically done by the IT operations teams. So they define what are the sources, how do you actually want to secure the data, and where do you want to provide these virtual copies for the test and development teams. And we have an interface that is actually designed for the IT operations teams to set up all of this. Now once this is automated and set up, then what we can do is for the application teams is provide functionalities that you typically only see within code development. So you can now refresh, so a developer now can himself refresh data, so he gets fresh data from production. Or you can branch data, so you can effectively version this data in the same way it versions code. You can bookmark data and share bookmarks with other developers with other environments, or synchronize different data sources as we, as we have seen, Oracle, SQL Server, in this case the application directory. <coughs> and also explain how it works, so this is, basically what you know from software development. So on the engine, you actually define your template, and the template defines what, are, what does your integrated environment actually consist about. So in this case, it's my Oracle data database, SQL Server database, and application configuration directory. And once you have this tried it, so think of a template as a class in software development, and you can now instantiate that class on your target servers. So you can now create copies of that data very instantly for your application development teams. Plus, you can have um, <coughs> communication between these containers in the way of bookmarks. So, a developer working on this container can now set a bookmark where he bookmarks at a specific point in time. I will later explain exactly how that works. And then you can share that bookmark, and someone else can pick that bookmark up. So, think of a, of a tester who finds an issue, can now bookmark that issue and share it back with the developer who opens up that bookmark and investigates that issue. But I will come back to that in, more, in, in, in a specific time. Um, we'll stay here for a while. So, so you have this template. You provision a copy of that integrated environment to your target servers. 
So you get, for example, your database is aligned to all 9 a.m. I don't know if you can see that in the black box. So at a bit later point in time, you, so you make everything ready for your test. So it's now 11.38, so you have created, done some testing or some stuff on that database, and you start your test. So then um, you set a bookmark to mark, that, to mark that particular point in time. Then maybe at <coughs> 11.28, your test completes, and you set another bookmark. So now what you can do using the self-service functionalities is, okay, reset my whole environment back to my initial bookmark. And you can run your second test. And that goes within minutes. Or you can also reset it back to the beginning. Or if you want, you can also choose to refresh your data. So that means you'll get a new copy from production ready in your development environment, again within minutes, independent of the size of the data. Do you believe me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, I have a little demo that I want to show. And I first want to show these different data sources. So I have a SQL developer. And as I said, I have a little HR schema in here. And we said our schema just contains of tables you would expect in an HR schema. And I can run my select star from employee, so it's my production database. Um, I have also this uh, folder sitting on the production system um, with an employee's text. So what I want to show is what I discussed earlier about the challenges around data masking. <coughs> two different data sources with the same customer data, and you want to mask it consistently. So as you can see here, uh, we have the same, the same custom employees and these and first names in this flat file. Now, let's assume you have a developer who now wants to have a new environment in which he can test this new or develop this new functionality. So now you'll just use your browser and navigate to the IP address of where this Adolf extension is deployed and you log in with your user account. What you then get is this sort of self-service interface. When I first saw this interface, it was meant to be like a video-on-demand platform. And I believe it's kind of easy to use as a video-on-demand platform. So what we see here is this timeline. So we see where <coughs> this environment got provisioned. And we see the latest point in time where this environment was actually running on the target system. So at the moment, we are just physically keeping the data files on the Delphi Center, but not consuming any resources on any target server. And when I scroll down here, then in the sources, I can actually see what this, what this environment consists about. So as a developer, I can directly see the application configuration directly, the Oracle database, the SQL Server database. <coughs> and using, using a shared storage, so I can also see the only amount of storage I actually need is what is the amount of change data I made of my personal environment, in this case about six megabytes, even so, being the, this environment being about in size one, of five, one and a half gigabyte, or it's about one and a half gigabyte in production. So every additional environment just adds the amount of change data the developer makes on this environment. So I'm going to start this environment, and what's now actually going to happen is that Belfix will connect to the target system on which the database should run. So it's the Windows server, the Linux server, uh, wherever that uh, directory is running on. It will then present the data files to the respective servers and start up the databases. So the only amount of, of time it actually takes to bring that environment up and running on target servers is how long does it actually take to start up the database? Yes, please. So you're saying that this one is connecting to the other server. So is there another Delphix server running there that's talking? No, so Delphix only physically holds the database files. Yeah, so you have a target server on which you have, for example, installed the Oracle binaries. So now we are presenting these data phase files at that particular point in time that you choose to the target server, so now they are available, and because we are using this shared block infrastructure, you can also do that instantly. Yeah, so typically the, the database is always looking at the files, right? So whether yeah. or not you are changing them underneath, that doesn't really matter, right? You don't have to connect to the server, the, the server is connected to you, because it's always reading from its <coughs> I see where you're coming from, so yeah. um, Delphix, Delphix is connecting to the target server, so it's logging in by an SSH session, 
then mounting the database files from ah, the right. Delphix engine okay. to the target server, and then uses that same connection to actually start up the start up the database instance. It does work. Yeah. So that is actually what's happened. Yeah, yeah, you are absolutely correct. So meanwhile, the database has started, and let's have a look at the database. And I apologize that this probably is a bit small, but we also have a big screen, so it might, might actually be doable. So now as a developer, I could connect to my database. Run the same statement. And what we now see is that actually the developer gets exactly the same data model, gets a copy of the production database almost instantly. But if you look at the data itself, it actually got masked. And that is because we mask the data on the staging environment and then use that mask copy as a, as a source database for downstream test development environments. Now, let's assume that at some point the developer, the, in production you got some changes, so I will simulate these changes. Um, so I will update the uh, employees table, and so currently this um, employee with employee day 101 is called Graham, and I will change that name to James. David, commit the changes. So now Delphix in the background is actually extrapolating the changes from the, from the source system. And now as a developer, the only thing I need to do to actually get a fresh copy from production is just hit the refresh button. And again, what, what, what's happening under the covers is Delphix is connecting to the target system, <laughs> remounting the data file or, unmount, or shutting down the database then unmount the data files and just remount the data files at the later point in time. And then it start up, starts up the database again. So if you think about the time it actually takes now to get fresh data in, is how long does it take to shut down the database and then start up the database again? <coughs> on my system a bit slower than on other systems because of all the instances running in the background on that server. But I mean, it's independent of the size of the database. So it doesn't matter if you have a one terabyte database, a 10 terabyte database, or 100 terabyte database, you can now refresh the database within minutes. So you have very quick turnaround times and very little downtime on the test and development environment. Are there any questions while we are waiting for the refresh? Yes, please. Are you only supporting um, SQL Server and Oracle at this moment? No, so we have uh, support for unstructured files which is for what we typically use for application data, but also application stacks. So if you think of, for example, eBusiness Suite, and you have an app stack, DB tech stack, um, database stack. So unstructured files. Um, we have Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres SQL, MySQL, DB2, um, Sybase. No progress? <laughs> Postgres. Progress. Progress, no. <laughs> not yet, not yet. I mean, Delphix is on the market since, or started, as a company started in 2008, and we look at the, the, the majority or the, the majority of the databases that are in the market at the moment. I believe Oracle is a database that stores most of the data, SQL Server probably coming close, and then you have MySQL, Postgres, and the other databases, but we are onboarding more and more databases um, over time. How does it work with the schema change on your dev system? I don't understand. So your development system works exactly the same way as previously. So you can just make a ch schema changes, panels, and so on. But I mean, when you refresh the database, it's the same as you take a re you take a backup from production or restore that in your test system. Then your old version is gone. <coughs> However, now what you can see is you have a breakup in this timeline. So you can see where actually that refresh happens. Now you can actually choose a previous point in time and also restore that previous point in time which helps you to invest to find errors again. Because now, you can actually, if you get a fresh copy and you test that new application release on the, on the new copy of the data, you get an error, you might think, is that because I, did, I got fresh data, so it's data related, or is it an error that I just haven't seen before? So now you can just go back in time, test that same functionality again. If you see that error, then probably it's not data related. If you don't see it, it's probably data related. So you may know where you start looking for 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 the bug. So let's have a look at the data itself after the refresh. So what I expect to see is 
the first claim yeah, of that employee was yeah. employee D101 was actually yeah. changed. So what is it, when you compare the two versions, so the original version, so this is, I didn't, didn't delete it, so you can see that only the first name of employee with the employee 101 has changed. And that's even true within the mask copy. So even in the, in the mask version of the database, you can only see, the, you, you only see those changes that have actually been made in production. And that is because in the background what we are using are deterministic masking functions. So for given input values, you always get the same output values. And that means that only those changes that you make in production actually make it through to the non-production non mask versions, which I believe is very important for those people actually working with the data. So Tessa so it's always their favorite records that they look up in the database that they work with. So now they, those records actually stay, stay the same as long as they don't change in production. Um, I want to show one other use case before um, before I go back to the presentation, I'm just looking at, at time. Are, are we still good for time or? Yeah, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. So now, um, the other thing is what I talked about is versioning and bookmarking of data. So now I can actually set a bookmark on my integrated environment. I call this uh, begin of test. And I can also, I can tag that and metadata that, data, um, that bookmark. So I now have for my integrated environment, Oracle SQL Server directory, I've set a bookmark, which could, uh, as I said, it's the beginning of a test, and I can now start and make some, some changes here. I'm just looking at my own right environment. So I can now, for example, say, uh, uh, put the rest of it and say, drop table. So I hope that also answers your questions about schema changes. It's maybe not a very effective test, though. <laughs> but at least I get some feedback, table, and please do it. So I could also create a table. So now I have exactly my time flow. I can see when I started my test and when I ended the test. And if I don't like those changes, I just pick the previous bookmark, click on restore, and now Belfix is actually connecting to the target system, which is connecting back to Belfix, and then I'm shutting down the database, remounting the data files from that particular point in time where I created the first bookmark, and then start up the database again. So now you can actually, now you can see how in, in a continuous delivery way, you now get as a developer this short feedback cycles. You can have a new, a new test, a new release, or a new functionality. You test it out on your large customer database or on various customer databases. You make a destructive test, and then you just roll, roll that over the beginning. So right at the beginning of the software cycle, you are now able to find the defects within your software. Does that make sense? I think it's all about when you think of Paolo's presentation about the feedback loops. <coughs> if I understand correctly, it, it, it doesn't really have to matter with the database, it's all about the underlying file system structure. Exactly. So it, it can be any database. Uh, well, technically, it can be any database because, because we virtualize unstructured file or directories as well. And database files typically are stored in some sort of directories if you're not looking at ASM or something. Mm -hmm. then but we have integrated the workflow so that we know how to read data, how to extract or, or how to extract changes from an Oracle database by using RML level one, um, RML level one backup and extract it on the Delphix engine. Um, we also, for example, for SQL Server, we then take the backups for MySQL. Yeah, we use replication method. So for the, for the for these databases, we have automated the workflows. But you're right in saying, well, you can you could implement your own workflows 
when you manage to do that on just a file system at a file system level. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Could you so use the data to restore a uh, disaster on production? Sorry? Could you easily use this data to restore a disaster in production? Yeah, that's absolutely so what I said at the beginning, I'm focusing on on project life cycles and shortened project cycles, per project cycles. But you're absolutely right. And so we had we had we had one uh, uh, one company who um, video on demand platform, and there was a guy who worked on the on the production system where he thought it was on the development system. I'm sure that happened to nobody in the room here. But <laughs> so he made some changes in the production, and at some point he realized what he did. So typically, what you would do is. You, you take a backup from that production database, you restore it on some, some staging server, um, you then take your level zero backup, level one, level one, level one, and you iterate to just before that incident happened, and then you start to restore the data into the production. And you are right in saying, well, now you have a copy sitting on this virtual appliance, you can spin it up almost immediately, and that's what they did. So they created a copy of production almost instantly on one target server, virtual copy, extracted that data into production, and they recover it within uh, I think it was 20 minutes or something. So it's absolutely, so the production support use case is an absolutely valid use case. You, you've run a test in this scenario. Um, <coughs> is this test not always running on the old data? Because you actually make a point of time as a start point and an end point. For example, if I rerun this test uh, in two months or so, it's still running on the old data, right? I didn't, I didn't completely get it. <laughs> Well, you, you've now created a test. For mm -hmm. example, yes. drop some tables, do some scenarios, or yes. some data. But that test is always situated on the old data, right? It doesn't upgrade because you record actually now the data is now. But if I rerun this test over two months from now, the data is still the same as now, right? So it's yeah, that's a good thing. It's an old, an old, old data in that case. Right? That's what you want at the bottom of the pyramid. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you want. It's not end-to-end -end test uh, with the current data. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe you want this too, but it's a good thing to be able to, to, to get that forever. I'm not sure, just uh, didn't get completely sure here. It's not if, um, but I think it was about the data you're working on. Um, so what Perhaps we're so your, your question is, can you run that test again on exactly. new production data? Yeah, can you? But yeah, I think that new working, so. yeah, so so you can so I could read I could um, click the, the refresh button but, but the refresh button again and then I can run the same test again of course but then I have I have more recent data or, or you know, more recent data from production and the result of the test might actually be different and I think that whole process is no different from what you do today right. so you may run the same test on after you have refreshed your environment a month later from production. But having this time flow capabilities, you could still go back in time and run the tests on the previous version of your database because now it becomes really easy to store many, many versions of the database. Uh, that, that one was first, and I think. I'm um, just wondering um, can you also keep track of uh, database states that are not related to each other? For example, a means product company support two clients that uh, client one has uh, an issue, and I would see if uh, the same scenario is problem with the uh, client number two. Mm. So the question is you have two two different database or two di different database states. Mm -hmm. And mm, me as a DevOps production company, um, I have noticed an error with client one because it filled me up. Yeah. And I'll see if the same scenario also gives errors with the database of client number two. I think nothing changes from what you're doing now. So it's just the ability of being able to provide provision a database at a specific point in time on a target server almost instantly. But it uh, supports that, that you can easily switch between those? Uh, Absolutely, yes. And we show that, I mean, I, I can pick that up. I'm just looking again at time. So we have uh, 10 minutes left, I guess. Um, I think what you're talking about is also, I mean, these bookmarks, they can now click on the share button, which means if you think of that, that, that slide that I showed earlier about the template and the various containers, so now I've shared this bookmark, and let me also stop this environment because I'll, otherwise I've, I'm running out of resources. Currently logged in as a developer. So now in the role of a tester, I'm logging back into the system. So as a tester, I have my own container I'm working on. I start that container, so now I 
even as a tester, I have my own environment, full-size database that I can run my tests on. And now if I go back to the bookmarks, or down to the bookmarks, I can actually see these, these bookmarks that have been shared within the same template. So now as a tester, I can pick up end of test. I'm just waiting for this one to complete. And now I can restore that bookmark in my own environment. So I get exactly that state in which the developer left his environment in my environment. So think of a developer who develops a new feature, bookmarks when he finishes it, and now the developer can pick, or the tester can pick up that bookmark and test out that new functionality almost instantly. So I restore it. <coughs> and again, if the tester now finds an issue, he can bookmark that issue. Give that bookmark the, the number, for example, the ticket number that it generates in Jira, and then the developer can pick up that issue, that ticket number, and, and, and resolve that issue. The tester, in the meantime, just resets his database and runs a second test. And every time he finds an issue, he just makes a bookmark and registers it in Jira or whatever. And just to say, all I'm showing here in the web UI is also available through a web service API. So that is what you need when you talk about Jenkins, when you talk about Puppet, Chef. So, and the Web Service API actually provides the same functionality as the UI, and that's just because of the architecture of this. So, the Web Service API is the main interface, and even the, the graphical user interface talks to the Web Service interface. So, every time you introduce new functionality, it first goes into web, the Web Service UI, and the, the Web Service API, and then it goes into the graphical UI because, first, because of the architecture, it first needs to be there. We also have a command line interface that can be used in the same way as uh, the Web Service API. So if you prefer doing something on the command line, that's also available. But typically when I show these things on the command line, it's much less exciting. <laughs> um, okay, so once a restore is complete, what I expect to have is um, I can open up a new connection as possible <coughs> so to my testing database. And given that this bookmark was at the end of the test, uh, there shouldn't be any employees table because that one got dropped. And that may be the first issue the tester actually locks in Jira. So the table is not existing anymore. I can now select star from TTT2. And I actually get, get this TTT2 table. Probably didn't come Change. Just remember that TTT table was already in the system, created TTT2, but then inserted into TTT. So actually, now as a tester, I introduced this new functionality as a tester, I found out what went wrong. <laughs> Briefly coming back on what I said earlier on the masking. So now I think I can even see in speed how this masking time goes away within the, the, recycle, within the refresh time. So these turnaround times are, not, are, no, no, more, are no longer impacted by the masking time. Um, you get realistic data as you have seen. And I've covered most of the, of, of the virtualization, but as part of that virtualization, we have a masking algorithms in the system as well that you can use. But you can also, in the staging environment, use your own masking scripts because that's what you want to use to mask the data. So you have those, those things. Um, what we also have seen is uh, data is getting masked consistently across the database and it's getting masked deterministically. So you only see changes in your test system that you have seen that actually made in the production system. And being able to refresh the data shows that the whole process can be repeated over and over again as there is demand for new, for new environments. Um, and just coming back a bit on these um, test cases, what we have seen in the self-service. So now as a developer, you can actually, and I've, I, haven't showed, I haven't showed that, but on that timeline, you can now say, from a particular point in time, create me an additional uh, a branch of that version. So you can say, Monday at 12 a.m., I want to create a new version, a new branch, or it could be that I want to develop a new release, so I create a new branch from my database, develop this new functionality on that branch, but still being able to go back to the previous version as I need to. And 
So now let's see the use case I explained earlier. So a developer can test and, and undo changes. So that is exactly what we have seen. Um, a developer can also uh, reset in minutes and, um, and re-execute whatever he did in this new functionality. <coughs> and most importantly, um, to increase and speed up the delivery with, with his self-service capabilities. So exactly the use case where I said, um, a tester finds an error in a new release, bookmarks that error wherever it occurs, and then developer now, as we have seen, can now take this bookmark, or because when it is shared, open up that bookmark in his environment, um, investigate what went wrong, but still being able to go back to his previous version. So when he was working on a, on a, on a new functionality already, he can investigate that error, but just opening up that bookmark, and then going back to his previous version, and continuing to develop on it. Um, a tester, in the meantime, has said, resets, resets the database, runs the next test. Um, and just a bit about on the functionalities that you saw on the on self-service, just being cautious of time and run over it. Um, one thing I want to focus on, I, mean, um, I think cloud, meanwhile, is a hot topic. Um, a main reason that I get when I want to talk to companies is why they don't want to use the cloud, cloud particularly in Germany, is um, they're concerned about data security. They don't want to share their production data with any cloud provider and putting it on there, particularly if they're in America. Now, what, you're, what we've seen is you have this Delphix engine sitting on premise, and you're able to mask the data on premise. So on premise, you have this unmasked and masked version of your database, which you're both able, and both you're being able to create a copy of that almost instantly. So a reporter can get an unmasked copy, tester can get a masked copy. Now, you can now put, because Delphix is just a software applies so that you put on a standard hypervisor. So you can now also put another Delphix engine on the AWS cloud, and then only replicate the masked version of the database across to your cloud provider. And then on that cloud provider, you can now instantly spin up test environments, development environments, with huge data sources, 10, 20, 30 terabytes. And everything that gets replicated is only the change data that you eventually get from production, mask, and then get across to, the, to your cloud provider. So I think this actually is, is also a cloud enabler if you're looking at test and development and extending your capabilities to, um, to cloud providers. Um, yeah, just as a summary, so I think given being able to mask the data um, is dramatically reduces the, 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 the total surface or, or the, 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 the surface of the tech. Um, I think typically when you, when, you, when you remove all these wait times for environments to get ready, um, you're enabling far higher productive utilization of these servers. And if you think of it from a, from a, from a commercial perspective, I mean, doing refreshes on these environments, which may take weeks or days, is a, is a not, not, not very efficient use of these environments. What you want to use these environments for is deliver new features, deliver new functionalities. And I think uh, the, second, the third one is actually what, what has been raised earlier, is it can also be used to reduce production outages. So first of all, you're able to create a production copy for forensic, uh, um, for forensic use uh, purposes to investigate an issue that you might have had on production. Um, but you're also developing more higher quality code because of these short feedback loops. Um, also, what we have seen at the beginning, before I started this environment, and uh, this is also, also a great use case for archiving environments. Now, to just, to just have an environment for compliance reasons, or for auditing reasons, you can just keep it on the engine without actually taking up resources on your target server. And it's only when you actually want to access the data is when you provision it to a target system and you can then investigate that data. And of course, um, uh, you have this high reduction of storage used on uh, non-production databases. And just showing that for my environment. So I'm logging out as this tester, and now as an administrator for, or in a, in a DBA role, potentially, logging on to Delphix to get this different, different UI. I can now have a look at this um, passage screen, hopefully. So what we see at the top is actually these source copies that we create from production. And you can see what I said earlier is that my production database is about 1.5 gigabyte in size. 
And when we took that copy of the Delphi Center, that's about a bit more than half a gigabyte of size, but keep in mind, this is not a point in time copy, but a rolling copy with a defined retention period. And you can see this mask sources, which are mask on the staging environment. And the only storage over there is a mask 10 megabyte worth of data. And all of these test environments adds a few more environments, uh, a few, few more megabytes of data. So in total, even my production system being one and a half gigabyte in size, I have a total of four environments in this case. I can then have many more of a, of a bit more than half a gigabyte. So dramatic savings in terms of storage. That concludes my presentation for today. Um, I hope you found it useful and uh, you got some information to take away. And um, thank you for listening all the time. Yeah, thank you. All this wonderful technology. What is the price tag? Let's talk about that later in the, in the room. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking right at this from a technical point of view, so I will get some questions in here. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk to to talk about that, but I'm um, happy to to have that discussion later. Before, um, get that. Very good. Talk to you. But 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 I think if you, if you look at it, what what is the price for the software and what what is the return? And that's the way you have to look at it. And that is the way. I uh, I'm sure that the software is flawless, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, what happens that if Delphix makes an error? Because uh, it's, it's pretty fundamental what it, what it does with the data, and how can you restore errors it makes uh, as a user? Yeah, you <coughs> corrupt your data completely. Yeah, so uh, absolutely better. I mean, um, so first of all, Delphix is typically used for non-production environments. So it's just connecting to the production environment to extrapolate to changes, but <coughs> the production environment is not impacted by any failures on the Delphix engine. And also, any refresh or any operations you do, there's no impact on the production system. Now, still, non-production systems being critical, and you don't want to have any downtime on it just based on an error in Delphix. So the use case that I showed for replication is also valid for two on-premise Delphix engines. So you can have replication enabled between a, have a passive and an active engine, and you could just fade over to the passive engine when you need to. Um, also, Delphi sitting on, for example, VMware, you have also these high availability capabilities of, of be sitting on a hypervisor. So you can have vMotion to migrate to a different uh, piece of server. So, but high availability always is, you have to look at what do you actually want to cover. Um, burning down your data center, then you may want to have one engine in one data center and another one in another data center. It's always about recovery point, uh, um, recovery point and recovery time that you want, or objective that you want to achieve. So I think it's it's a more detailed discussion that you have that you would have to have depending on exactly the use case you are looking at. Any more questions about what you've seen? Yes, please. Maybe a diff bit different. But from a continuous delivery viewpoint, why would you want to have all the data from production in your testing environment? I think that the, the main reason is, uh, um, is that to really efficiently develop and test software, you would want to do that on the production environment. But that obviously isn't possible. So the nearest you can get is a full copy of your production environment. And the reason you don't do that typically is because it's so complicated to put it in place and the data is so huge to get it in there. So you work with subsets or synthetic data, for example. But I think the best results of a test case is what you get on the real data. Would you not agree on that? No, I'm not a fan of the databases in any way. So okay. <laughs> I try to skip them whenever possible. <laughs> But for example, uh, for our microservices, mm -hmm. uh, in our development environment, we just boot up a uh, database. Uh, we execute the, uh, the, the yeah, what is it, the, the, the uh, startup scripts, and they fill up the database with every da data that I need for my tests. Mm -hmm. And that's all the data that I need, which is basically uh, a few records, yeah. and they test the cases that, that I came across. And if I find an issue in production, then I recreated that issue in my test database, and I can test anything that I want. 
Well, I think well, that, that's absolutely valid for your particular environment. But as you go further down the program of the process and getting to the end of that project life cycle, you get into a performance test environment, for example, where you do a, a test on a full-size database, or you get to a user UAT environment. At some point, you may want to do a, a test on a full-size database, even if it's just to get a feeling on <coughs> does your script run in the amount of time it needs to run on. And I had a, 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 when, I, when I worked for, for for a telecommunication company in Germany, I developed a nice feature to get uh, well, that was when Tcom and T Online merged together. And they needed to get the orders over from TCOM to T Online because they wanted to <coughs> both together have internet and telephone as a as a package to deliver it to customers. So I tested all this functionality and we did, did all this functional testing. And then we released that new functionality into production. And then the next morning, when we got the first about one, one gigabyte size of orders into the system, and what was full of XML data, and I came in and it just finished, I think, most five or ten percent of the data. And I got a heart attack, really. <laughs> and I, and I think that is just because I didn't test it efficiently and not on full size data. So I think what I did then is I, could, I was able to create some indexes and, and therefore solve the, the issue on the tables. But I think what it shows is I mean, the further down the road you get, I mean, the more difficult it is to, to fix the issues earlier in the life cycle. Last question. On, on top of that, uh, sometimes you can't reproduce an issue, which is in production you found that. Um, in dev environment or test <coughs> environment, you can't reproduce, then you need to get data in your test environment to reproduce it. So that is why it is very useful to get your refreshed data in your test environment. But do you then need all the data or only those? In some, yeah, cases, you say? in some cases, you really need it. Uh, it. I mean, I have seen that many times that uh, uh, they have an issue in production, but you can't reproduce it in test. So you obviously, you know that it is data related. But you get a refresh uh, data from the production and you try to replicate that issue. The first problem is that you don't know yeah. where the problem is, so you, you can only have to. Af uh, afterwards, you know what data you should have copied. Uh, well, it's probably that moment with you one don't specific know. order, specific, specific but user. I think right? there's, there's, there are valid use cases where you just may want to work on very small sets of data. And there might also be training environments where you do not want to have this long running batch shots where you want to have. Quick results. So there are good reasons why you do not want to have full sets of data. But I think in general it improves quality if you work on a like-for-like -like environment. And then if you look at, I mean, all these DevOps tools like Papa, Chef, where you code your infrastructure, or where you have Docker and you provide this application container on, on, on your target server, then still the question resides: so what are you going to do with your 20 terabyte database? I, I no, and, and I think that is a missing link in the whole story. So once you solve the, 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 the bottleneck of having, having the data, or the data as being a bottleneck in time to get it over to your non-production systems, then that enables the usage of all these DevOps tools, or like Jenkins for continuous integration, Chef, Papa. But I agree that in, in, very, that in some use cases that might not be the case and you may want to work on very small sets of data where you do where you run a test to get quick results. Again, what I said at the beginning, so Jim is available also for questions because we, we, um, uh, he's very knowledgeable in Delphix and we, we work together with him on, that, on uh, particularly in the Netherlands. And of course, I'm available in the evening if you want to grab me and have some more questions about what you're seeing here. <coughs>